Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. There, that's a, that's, that's a I had to take a closer look. Yeah. Praise God. Children are truly a blessing, aren't they? Amen. They really are. Uh, praise the Lord. How many people today have come for God's Word? If you come for God's Word today, I hope that you have. Amen. Praise the Lord today. And I'm really excited about this message. One of all, it's Communion Sunday, so we're taking in the Lord's Supper uh, at, the, at the end. But the, I'm really excited about this message today because it deals with the topic of calling on the Lord. And, uh, and King David, he understood what it meant to call on God, especially when he was being chased down by his enemies. And when, when he, you know, when he was in trouble, he knew when to call on the Lord. And we're going to break down these eight verses here today from Psalm 18 that, that break this down. And we're going to get an understanding of what it means to call on the Lord when to call on the Lord, and why to call on the Lord. How many people here know somebody that needs to call on the Lord? All right, praise the Lord. Okay, how many here, maybe today, you know you need to be the one to call on the Lord, praise be to God. And so it's pretty awesome when you think about it. And the one thing about calling on Jesus is you never get a voicemail. You can't say busy signal anymore because nobody even knows what that is. All right, because everything either goes into a voice. Young people don't even know what a busy signal is. It just goes into your voicemail. You know, you don't, you don't get that beep, beep, you know, that noise and drive you crazy because somebody's still taking their phone off the hook. We live in a time now the busy signals are gone. But you're not going to get a voicemail. You're not going to get a, a text message. He's out of the office with one of those out of the office replies, you know, that some people leave. You know, you're not going to get that. If you call on the Lord, he will hear you today. And church, the one thing about the Lord is, some people will say, well, you know, you can wait too long to call on. I believe if there's breath in your body, it's never too late to call on the Lord. Amen. I believe no matter how desperate or how bad a situation may get in your life, you can still call on the Lord if there's breath in your body. And I believe today, church, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God wants to do some great things here at Praise Assembly, and a great reason why we're not seeing miracles, or we're not when people say, you know, why am I going through this, and what, you know, this and this and this, and you know, everything you might read or hear is simply for one reason: we haven't called on God yet. Right. Right. We want someone else to help us out, or we'll just work our way through it. Or I'm a survivor. Right. Well, you know what, church? If you if you call on God today, you might become, rather than a survivor, you might become a fighter. You might become someone different. And God is there waiting for us to call on Him for whatever it might be. And church, think about this. Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't know a loved one needed help? And you next thing you know, you know, you if you had just told me, I would have been glad to help you with some food. Or I would have been glad to help you with a pair of shoes. Or I would have been glad to help you come over, you know, and help you with some housework. Or I'd be glad to come over and help you with some car repair. Or I'd be glad to have taken you to Farmington. But you didn't tell me, therefore I couldn't help you. Well, you say, well, Pastor God's all-knowing. He already knows. Yes, he does, but he still wants us to call on him. Let me say that again. God's all-knowing, but He still wants us to call on Him. Amen. Even when it's obvious. Even when it's obvious that you need help, or even when it's obvious that you need wisdom, or you need God's direction, or you need whatever it might be, God is there saying, will you ask me? Will you call on me? Church, if you study King David's life, you will see where that brother, he was in trouble a lot. He was in trouble from King Saul uh, all the way through his reign. He was in trouble where enemies were surrounding him and other countries wanted to become the top nation in the world. And, and it, was, it, it was not pretty a lot of the time. His own family, his own sons were after him. But he knew what it meant to call on the Lord. And the Lord was faithful to him from the beginning to the end. 
Church, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that this could be your best Christmas ever if you'll call on Jesus. If you choose not to, you're going to let the hoopla overwhelm you. You're going to let everything, you know, that opposite of what these children just said to us about what Christmas is. And you're going to let all that kind of control the shots. And before you know it, Christmas is going to be over. New Year is going to be over. And you're going to be right back to work and school and wonder what the world happens. Well, church, it's time that as Christians, we start looking at Christmas as well as resurrection season as the two biggest events of the year for Christians. As we celebrate the birth of Jesus in December, and next year, Resurrection Day is in March in 2016. But whether it's resurrection time or Christmas time, this should be the two biggest times for us. But you know what I'm finding as a pastor? It's also the hardest time to call on the Lord. Especially, especially if we, if we think we shouldn't be in the situation that we're in anyway. So I don't want to call on God. I, I want to get out of this myself. In church, you know what? God loves you so much that even when you blunder, He desperately wants to help you. Amen. If you'll call on Him. You guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 18. And we're going to be looking at the first six verses of the Bible. The book of Psalms is in the middle of the Old Testament. If you do not have a Bible or cannot find it, I believe it is on the screen for you uh, here this morning. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Psalm 18, beginning with verse 1 through verse 6. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Amen. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. Amen. My shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surround me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surround me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seen. Church, here this morning we're going to, to get real serious with God again, of course, as we break down these verses. And anytime you see Sheol, or what the King James, New King James talk about Sheol, uh, referring to hell and the, and the tricks of the adversary and the temptation of the adversary comes about like a roaring lion, we have to really get serious uh, because there are folks who, who sometimes they, they feel like their lives are nothing more but a living hell and they're surrounded by all this pain and torture and surrounded by the anguish and, and uh, anxiety of the world. And as I prayed earlier, the Bible tells us to cast all our cares upon the Lord for He loves us. And church, I believe God loves us here today, but... I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have to understand how much we love Him. Last night at prayer meeting, I walked with little Hannah around there in that section, and I walked around with her saying, Lord, who loves you? Who loves you with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength? Who loves you, Lord? We know and we understand that God loves us. We've heard that many times before. Sometimes we have the question, why does He love us? But we've heard that. The question here that you have to first ask yourself in Psalm 18, 1, is do you love the Lord? Do you love Him? And last night I was praying, Lord, who loves you? And church, I believe that God is beginning to answer that prayer before our teenagers, before our adults, and before our seniors of who really loves Him. And at Christmas time, it's a great opportunity to find out who his faithful children are and who truly loves him and truly will make his birth in, uh, in a manger in a little town of Bethlehem, you know, to Virgin Mary and to Joseph, you know, and who will stand up and defend the faith and who will let the real reason for Christmas carry out this year. I believe we're going to find out, you know, church, also that if we love God truly, we will not be ashamed to call on Him because we know He is our Heavenly Father who sent His Son not only to save us from our sin, but to give us life and life more abundantly. King David opens up verse 1 by saying, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. 
He makes a declaratory statement. It's not a question. He's not saying, Lord, may I love you? Can I love you? He's making the statement, I will love you, praise the Lord, with all my strength. Are you ready to do that here today on this uh, two weeks before Christmas? Are you ready here to make that statement, I will love you? I will love you no matter how hot it gets in the kitchen, no matter how stressed out my life becomes, no matter how many obstacles I have to jump, no matter what I go through should persecution come my way, I will love the Lord. Amen. Church, think about it. If God sees that little bit of faith from us and we apply that love to calling on Him, I believe God's going to open up the windows of heaven and start doing miracles in your life. And the lives of your children who've gone astray. And the lives of your parents who've gone astray. And the lives of your spouses who have gone astray. I believe, church, that God wants to tell this whole river valley how much He loves us. Loves us but I believe He's also looking to see how much we'll love Him. Do you know love's a two-way street? Yes, we love God because He first loved us on the cross, praise the Lord. Yet while we were still sinners, He died for us. And He was praying for us according to John 17. But church, do you know that any relationship, if love is not a two-way street, that relationship is going to be broken. Right. I am to love my wife as I love the Lord, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 5. Church, the Bible also says, you know how much parents are supposed to love their children from the point of conception right to the very end of their life. Love is huge and the love of God is the same way. God desperately desires and wants to know today, do we love Him? David opens up this psalm with a statement, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. David knew where his help came from. Church, today some of you need to call on the Lord because you've been trying to do everything yourself. Church, you've been trying to answer things yourself. You've been trying to do things physically yourself. You know, you've been doing all this X, Y, and Z, solving and saving everybody's day. You know, blah, 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 blah. But church, let me say this. King David, he said, Lord, I love you. Oh, Lord, my strength. Praise be to God. David knew where his help came from. And David knew that, you know, there were some times nobody else could help him but God. Think about that. We go to pastors and we go to teachers. We go to physicians. We go to counselors. We go to our friends. We go to our parents. You know, we go to various, various people, you know, for, for help. And there are times where people cannot help. There are times, parents, you're not going to be able to help your child. There are times you're not going to be able to help your parents as much as it pains you. Especially if enablement is taking place. But church, you can go to God, and if He is your strength, He will help you. How does He become your strength? By loving Him. By loving God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Jesus said in Matthew 22 that we are to love Him with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Love is important, and David makes that statement. Are you ready to do that here today? Are you ready to say that you will love the Lord who is your strength? Well, pastor, God's given me a lot of, or I have a lot of abilities. Here. I'm, a, I'm an independent person. I'm a strong-willed person. You know, I, I have a lot of gifts. Yep, and God gave you every one of them. Without God, you can't even breathe. You will not even be able to get out of bed. Moses writes in Deuteronomy that everything from your strength and your breath is a gift of God. Amen. Be careful your foot shall slip in due time. You think you will be strong enough to go through the obstacles of life by yourself. And next thing you know, you will find you are actually on thin ice. And you will say, how did that person who is so healthy, how did that person who looks like they have it all together, they drive a nice car, they're educated, they're, they look good and all that stuff, how did they collapse right in the middle? How did they have a heart attack so young? How did they, you know, blah, 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 that you can come up with what happened? Many instances they forgot where their strength came from. And that the Lord is the one. It is the, he is the one who gives that to us. And we must love him. We must care for him. King David knew that without God, he would not have been able to fight off Saul. King David knew that without God, he would not have been able to fight off his own children. 
Absalom and others. King David knew that without God, when, when he tried to do something without God, what happened? He had an affair with Bathsheba. A baby boy was conceived and then a baby boy was born. And at one week old, that baby boy died. King Uriah was killed by David. Or, I'm sorry, Bathsheba's husband Uriah was killed by, by David. Okay, and so it was just a big mess. When we get away from God, things seem to, seem to fall apart. But because we're devoted to loving Him. And church, let me, this is something else I'm learning too, is people are, you know, talking to different folks. And this is, this is one of the biggest reasons I think a lot of folks are struggling with prayer today. Corporately as well as individually. Is because they feel like they've let God down and they, they just don't, well, God doesn't want to hear anything I have to say. Church, you're a child of God if you're a believer. God wants everything to hear. Yeah, it wants everything you have to say. And the thing, you know what, that's the hardest is maybe, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Or maybe it's, Lord, yep, you, you told me, Lord, but I tried to do it my way. You know what, sometimes we all have to eat a little humble pie every now and then. But it's going to make us stronger. But we're going to do that because we love the Lord. We love Him and He is our strength. He is our strength, church. Verse number two, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. King David quotes what he already said earlier back in 1 Samuel. But here, church, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. Church, do you know today that if you love God and you call on Him, you will find just how strong God really is? You will find just how awesome He is and that He is solid as a rock. His fortress will shelter you and protect you and He will deliver you out of whatever mess you are in today. I don't know about that, Pastor. You really got a faith problem. You really have a faith problem today, church. If you don't believe that God is your rock and that He can, he can handle whatever may come your way, that He is your fortress, that He can protect you, and put a shelter around you with His Holy Spirit and heavenly angels to protect you. And that He can deliver you out of whatever situation or whatever addiction you are in today. That God can set you free. If you don't believe that, you have a faith problem. And if we have a faith problem, we're saying, I'm not going to call on the Lord because I really don't believe He can do it anyway. Right? If you didn't believe these chairs could hold you up, you wouldn't have sat out. I mean, it's that, this is this is really the Old New Testament all comes back to faith. And church here, God is desperately wanting us to call on Him because we love Him and that He is our strength and that we know through faith He is our rock, He is our fortress, He is our deliverer. Amen. And I know many of us here need this today. Many of us need this today, church. Many folks need to realize it's seeker swim time as believers in the community. As, you know, as things begin to happen, God wants to be our strength. And God is raising us up for such a time as this. Young people, this is a lesson for you to learn. That, that may you love the Lord and may you know that He is your rock, He is your fortress, and He is your deliverer. Amen. Because adults will fail you, young people. Whether it be your spouse, whether it be a friend, your parents, your pastor, other believers, they will fail you. It'll be difficult to get through, but God will not. God will protect you. God will give you and show you how much He loves you and that He cares for you. Then King David goes on to say, My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. He makes another declaratory statement by making this, that God is His strength. This is the second time we've already heard that in two verses. And then he says, in whom I will trust. So next out of faith, when it comes to calling, calling on the Lord, do you trust Him to be there to take your call? Do you trust Him? One, do you have faith in the Lord that He will answer you? But then do you trust Him to take your call? Thursday night at our ministry team meeting, and most people know the schedule is, my schedule is changing, and praise the Lord, two weeks down next month, it's really going to change with different things so that I can be healthier myself and, and all these, these kinds of things. But one of the things that I'm hearing is, Pastor, you're, you, we trust you because you're available. Well, church, you know what? You need to trust God above me. Amen. This is important stuff. Look at that. You know, I mean, it's when you think about it, here is the Lord in whom I will trust with all of my strength. 
With when you say, Pastor, you know what? But your your flesh, you're an actual voice I can hear. You just gave yourself away as a person that does not have faith. Because the Bible says that the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. The Bible says that God will speak to you because you are his child. You have a faith problem, now you have a trust problem. But today that can all be different. I bring good news. That can change today. You can call on the Lord and you don't have to worry about his phone being off and going right into voicemail. The question is, will you take time to listen to him? The question is, do you love him? Do, is he your strength? Do you believe in faith that he is your rock, your fortress, and your deliverer? Again, do you believe that you can trust in him? Church, God can do all things but fail. Why do we have a problem with, with trust with the Lord? Well, if it's God, I shouldn't be suffering. Jesus never promised that to you. Matter of fact, it's the complete opposite. We're to rejoice in our suffering. We're to rejoice in our anxiety. Some people, God just blesses and does great things physically, financially, relationships, but it's still not enough. Well, God just, I have one little off church. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean you're not going to have hurdles to jump. I'm in serious trouble. This has been the hardest year for Mary and I. We were just talking. We cannot wait to get to 2016. It's been the hardest year for us financially. One thing after another. Since last January, or really the end of 2014, when her parents got sick, to the very present day, it has been very hard. I'm in great trouble if what I'm doing proves that God doesn't love me anymore because of all these financial issues we're having. Because one obstacle, now my cars had problems, and, and uh, heating two houses, and horse dying in the middle of the frozen leech field. You know, all types of things that we've had to deal with uh, this year, church. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that like God loves me. Amen. And he's building our faith. That's right. And he shows time and time again how much he loves me. And loves Mary, and loves Hannah, and he loves you too. Too often though, church, we can never see God come through and bless us because one, we don't call on him. Two, have you ever started to call somebody, but before it even rang the second time, you hang up because you don't want to really talk. You, you you lost your nerve. And so we hang up on God before he even picks up, you know, to answer us. Or when he does answer and he gives us a response, we don't like what he has to say, so we just hang up on him. All right. What do we do on Facebook? When we don't like what someone has to say, we just defriend him. <laughs> you know, we just, you know, it just, we just tap out. Well, church, here we've got to understand that we're going to trust the Lord. And he is going to be our strength. And he is going to be our fortress and our rock and our deliverer. He's going to be the one in which we trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. The shield steps out as the, the Roman armor, Ephesians 6, the armor of God. You know, I mean, the shield is out there to protect us from the fiery darts. King David knew that the darts would come his way. But if he was with God, if he was calling on God, if he was loving the Lord, he wasn't just going to quit when things get tough. Parents, do you stop loving your children when you go through a bumpy road? I hope not. I hope not. Well, pastor, they did a terrible thing. Yeah? Does that mean you stop loving them? What kind of parent would that be? What kind of a brother or sister in Christ would that be? What kind of God would that be if he just gave us and kicked us to the curb after one mess up? God is a forgiving. He's a loving God. Yes, his grace will not abound. Yes, he desires us to live holy lives. Yes, sometimes we must repent and get right. But guess what? When we do that, God shows his love and he puts his amazing loving arms around us and he begins to bless us and strengthen us. Why? Because he's our rock. He's our fortress. He's our deliverer. Now King David says that he is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God is my ever-present hope in spite of the storm. Think about that, church. Think about that. Please. As you call on the Lord, is He your hope today? Amen. Is He your blessed hope? Is he, is he the one that you believe is going to carry you through? And that your salvation will become your stronghold. Church, if you have nothing else to worship God but your salvation, you should be standing and lifting up the name of Jesus if you're physically able. If you can't stand, then you can sit there and worship the name of Jesus. And worship in your heart and lift up a hand if you can we all can do something to worship the Lord, even if it's nothing more than rejoice in our salvation. You say, Pastor, I had a rough Thanksgiving. You say, Pastor, my, I'm, in, I'm in the dark. I didn't pay my bill. Yeah, pa I mean, I made a bad financial move. You know, all the other negative things. You know what? You still have your salvation. You should be rejoicing and praising God. Amen. What's wrong with us, church? 
If I was an unbeliever, sometimes when I look at some people, I think, I want no part of that. If that's what Christianity is, I want to run somewhere else. We have our salvation we can rejoice. And that salvation is your stronghold. Why? Because salvation is, is centered around not only of this earth, but we're going to spend eternity with God because we're His children. Amen. That's our stronghold. That's our hope. That's what, that's what excites us in these last days as everything's falling apart. That's what our excitement is as, as we get back to reality. That's what our excitement is, church, when we understand, you know, who Jesus is and that we can call on the name of our Lord and that He is our stronghold. Lord, forgive us with doom and gloom. Forgive us, you know, when we, we don't feel like being in church. Church, I love Sunday, and I'm not going to miss it as long as I'm physically able, whether it's here or some other church, praise the Lord, because I love worshiping with other believers. Amen. This is a taste of heaven. This is a stronghold. I feel better after being in that God's house. Amen. What, could, what could home possibly do? You know, it's pastor, well, you can worship God at home. Yeah, you can worship God at home, but I'd rather worship God with 50 other people. Amen. Would you rather go to a football game and be the only one there? Or would you rather go, hey, there's other people here? You know, if you go shopping, you know, would you, you know, you like going with folks. You like talking, you know, like talking about deals and like shopping and trying on dresses. Ladies, I wasn't born last night. You like, many, most ladies like to go with someone else. Well, church, it's the same thing with God's house. We like to be able to worship God and rejoice in our salvation, our stronghold. And then, then we get to the nitty gritty right here. Verse 3. King David writes, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. People say, Pastor, why do you always say that when you're worshiping God? Worthy to be praised. Because that's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. All the New Testament, He is worthy to be praised. Amen. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And church, so when you call on Jesus today, I pray the first thing you're going to say is, Lord, I love you. Secondly, you are worthy to be praised. Amen. Because you're King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's the one thing that we all have in common here, I hope, as Christians. Some of us here are patriot fans. Some of us here love the loyal, lowly Cleveland Browns. <laughs> but you know what? You stick with your team. But guess what? If you're a believer, we're all unified because we all should be wearing the same jersey as a Christian. And Jesus is worthy to be praised. I mean, that's exciting to me. And when we call on Him, we say, Lord, I love you. You are worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Lord, thank you for protecting me. I can call on you in this storm and as, as my whole world is coming around me. Lord, I know that you love me. I know that I love you. And Lord, I know you're going to protect me from the wiles of the devil. And all the temptation and all the snares. And there's those say, Pastor, why aren't people doing this? It's because they have a trust problem, they have a faith problem, they have a love problem. And then their world's falling apart. Many times they'll ask people, when they call me, well, have you prayed about this? No, oh, Pastor, I just called you. Well, then you need to hang up with me and call God. Call me back later. You know, this is important stuff, church, that we grasp this, that we understand this. I will call upon the name of the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Wow, the salvation, the hope that we have in God, our stronghold, is so awesome and so amazing. Church, will you call on Him today? Will you call on the one who is worthy to be praised. Verse 4, King David writes, The pains of death surrounded me, and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. To where David is saying, My world is just caving in. All this unrighteousness that's coming around me. My enemies are getting closer and closer and closer. There's no room for righteousness. There's no air to breathe righteousness. I am fully surrounded by this pain. But guess what? God is there with you in that storm. Right. Church, no matter what you're going through, why is it so easily forgotten by many? Why is it because, one, misery loves company. Some people, they love to feel bad. Church, I'm an optimist. I hope that you feel hope when you're around me. And not just this doom and gloom. All the world is, the world is ending. Well, the world's coming to an end. Surely Jesus is coming soon. You know, all this negativity and just pulling people down. You know what? As Christians, we should be pulling people up. We should be building one another up. You know, and here David, though, he says, this is all, all this is around me. 
I'm being flooded by ungodliness. Yes, I'm afraid. Maybe you're here today and you're afraid. Well, there's no better time to call on God than when you're afraid. Amen. Why? Say, Pastor, why is that? Because then in your weakness, God's strength and His grace is sufficient for you. Sometimes we have to look up. Some people are like, men can't be afraid. I'm a mighty man of God. Yeah. So you're going to fall flat on your face, too. And you're only going to make things worse in your pride and in your arrogance. Be like David. Call on the name of the Lord who is worthy so that you will be saved. Church, in these last days, even in America, we're going to need to call on God more than ever. Amen. You better start calling on Him because someone has your ear. And that someone could very well be working for the adversary to pull you away from God. And Christmas time, we see this happening all over the place. Well, Pastor, I really can't bring up what I believe. Why can't you bring up what you, why you, what you believe? Why can't you make a stand and be strong in, in who you are? Well, I'm just surrounded by the enemy and all this. We give Satan so much credit. If we would simply call on God, we feel a lot better. We would feel victorious. You know, we tell our children not to beat themselves up. Where do you think our children learn it from? <laughs> they learn it from mom and dad. They learn it from those in which are around them, who are influencing them. Why don't we begin to influence others by representing God after we call on Him? And after we declare we love Him? And after we declare that He is our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our strength, the one in whom we will trust. He is our shield. He is our stronghold. He is worthy to be praised. He's the one who has saved me even as death surrounds me. Amen. Church, as Paul said, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? What do you have to fear as a believer? You call on the Lord, even if you die, you can rejoice because you know where you're at to be absent from the body, to be present. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And be victorious. Fear is not from God. But men, we're learning that in men's group. Fear is not from God. We're to build our faith. Fear and the, and the voices of fear, that's nothing but the adversary deceiving you. Verse number 5, David gets real graphic. The sorrows of Sheol surround me. The snares of death confronted me. So the sorrow of Sheol means hell. The sorrows of hell surrounded me. Everywhere around him. Sorrows of hell. The adversary tries to seek, kill, and destroy. The adversary is filled with, with addiction. Everything opposite of the rock fortress and deliverer. He's wishy-washy. He's filled with addictions. He's filled with broken promises. He's filled with a shelter that has a leaky roof. He's filled with all that negativity things. And this is all surrounding David. The snares of death confronted him. Church, let me, get, let me just share this with you. If God be for you, who be against you? What do you have to fear if God is before you? David, is, as Sheol was surrounding him, and all this ungodliness was around him, even to the point where he was afraid, as the snares of death were confronting him, and the sorrows of hell were all around. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt Amen. that God was with him. Amen. Church Mary and I have known this entire year that God's been with us every step of the way. <laughs> we saw God last month meet our need of over $3,000 to pay property tax and excise tax, um, Andover's taxes jumped up 40% to save our school, and we had about a month's notice once we got the bill. We saw God do a miracle. Amen. I can tell you that right now. I went in the first of I went in the, the first day of November. The taxes were due, and I this is a miracle. And I told myself at the end of the month, I have no idea I'm going to pay my excise tax. But I went in there on November 28th, and I said, "Here's another gift of God." Here are the, the excise taxes. I don't even know how that's legal. Excise, that just stirs me up. Think about paying for a car that's older than some of our teenagers here. I'm still paying big bucks for it. For my truck, over $400 to pay for that thing. It just drives me crazy. That thing's a 1999. How am I paying for this? Over and over and over and over. But i got to run for office, so that's a big job. <laughs> but you know, church, this is, this, is, this is something. You know, and it was difficult. And it was frustrating. It really was. And then you begin to, then the adversary loves to play the doubt card. If you're feeling like a doubter today, you need to call on Jesus. Amen. Because that doubt is not from God. That doubt is from the adversary. But then you begin to doubt as all this is caving around you over an entire year. And you sit there and you say, Lord, 
You know, am I doing am, am I doing something wrong? Lord, what is wrong with this picture? And and then, you know, you kind of lose sight of reality of what's going on. We had a ten thousand dollar deductible for Hannah because of the insurance. And it's like, Lord, why did I trust you when we got the insurance to have a prenatal care plan, but we figured we weren't gonna have any children after fifteen years, so we did a ten thousand dollar deductible. Sure enough, a month later, here's Hannah's all the way. You know, but you know, this is this is what this is what you have to this is what you have to think about, and this whole world's came in, and then, and then you start to doubt, and then you realize, oh yeah, I'm a child of the king. Amen. Why is my heart troubled? Amen. Let me call on God. Amen. And God has been faithful time and time again, just last month. Church, I know what God can do. I serve an awesome God here today. I know it's not easy. And I know it feels like that the pains of death are surrounding you as you're confronted with it. As you are so broken and, and so hurt. And some of you here may feel the exact way. But you can call on God. And that's exactly as we close verse 6 here today. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. Are you feeling distressed today? You can call upon God. Yes. You know, in your distress, He is there waiting for you. King David writes, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. Notice he didn't say, I called upon my father, Jesse. I called upon my nine older brothers. I called upon King Saul. I called upon all these other people. That's not what David did. He said, I called upon the Lord, the one in which he declared, I will love you with all my strength. The one who declared he is worthy to be praised. The one who declared who will save him from his enemies. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. You ready to do that today? Are you ready to encourage someone else to call upon the Lord? Well, Pastor, how do I know he will hear me? Because he's a faithful God. He loves you. Church, we sometimes we define ourselves, even by a few simple words, how little faith we really have. Do you know that even if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain to come down? Right. The Bible says you can tell that, that branch to wither by the authority given to you as a child of the king. You have the same authority that Jesus spoke with, the authority of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, there are many things that you can do, but you have to call on the Lord if you don't call on Him. If you leave God out of the equation, that's like going to play baseball without your bat. Right. Or without your glove. You know, that's what that's like. Or that's, you know, that's like going out playing tackle football in the NFL and you leave your helmet and shoulder pads in the locker room. You're in trouble. Big trouble. You know, or if you decide to, I remember one time, my mother, she wanted to go play tennis with my, my brother and I. And she said, I got a racket. I don't know if she had a racket. I said, Ma, okay, let me go out to the shed and get it. I'm thinking, she's going to bring out one of those old wooden rackets from the 70s. What is she bringing out here? You know, and she wanted to play tennis and she brings out a badminton racket. <laughs> I said, Ma, you can't play tennis with this thing. Oh, yeah, I can't. That, thing, that thing's going to break. You're, you're, you're going to, you just don't do that. But she wanted to have some quality time with her boys before they grew up. That's what she told us. You know. I said, all right, Ma, you want to you know, play. And of course, we're just lobbing across. And the ball's not going anywhere because you hit a birdie with a bat. And you don't hit a tennis ball. You know, and then so we, she went and bought a racket after that. We did play for about two or three months. Um, when Lauren and Ron were little, but that was just that was just something. That, but you have to have the right tool, or or it's going to be it's going to be funny, hilarious, or you might get hurt. Well, church is the same thing with God. We've got to have God because if we don't have God in the equation, we might get hurt, or it might get worse. Certainly, you know. And so here, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. Notice this, and He says, and cried out to my God. How long has it been, church, since you really cried out to God? Right. Well, Pastor, I don't have time. What do you have time to do? Spend hours on Facebook? What do you have time to do? Watch your favorite television? What do you really have time to do, church? What do you have, what do you have time? You don't have time to cry out to God and call on Him and know that, you're, know that He will bless you and that He will help you in your ever-present storm? Well, I really don't want to call on Him because He's going to confront me with my problems. Well, maybe it's those problems why you got yourself in a mess. Maybe that's the biggest issue you have. You know, church, I'm not interested in treating symptoms. What is treating symptoms doing? Just a, a, avoiding the inevitable. Taking a, if you're banging your head against that pole there, and you take some 
a prescription drug or you take Tylenol, all you're doing is treating the pain. As long as you keep banging your head, you're going to keep being in despair. You know, you're, that's just common logic. All right? And so here the Lord, he may confront you with that. But don't be afraid. Say, you know what, God, you love me. We do the same thing with our children. You know, we, we're already teaching Hannah. She's crawling up a storm. She's going to places she shouldn't go. She wants to pull down the, the little monitor, you know, for her, her bed monitor. She wants to pull it. Says, no, you know, son, John, you can't do that. Your son, John's going to go out on you real quick if you, start, if you keep doing this. You know, and all that kind of thing. You know, you, you can't do that. Why? Because we love them. Well, God loves us. In church, if we're doing something we're not supposed to do, don't just enjoy the pleasures of the world. Say, okay, Lord, I know you love me. I'm calling on you. And maybe this fleshful problem is what's causing my headache. And let God move in your life. And let God do it. If you, if you love him, you should want to respect him. He's jealous for you, church. He's jealous for you. He loves you so much. David writes, and I cried out to my God. He didn't cry out to something else. He cried out to his God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Continuing on, he heard my voice from his temple. Church, you can be assured today that God will hear your voice too. If you call out to him. Notice here, there's very literal things that are taking place. David is crying out, God is here. David just to say, I thought in my mind and God heard. You know, it's important to, to understand this, church. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Church, God is more than ready to extend his ears to this part of the earth and make praise assembly his footstool Amen. and hear our cries. Amen. I know there's despair going on in many people's lives. Or, or, and maybe somebody you know and love is going through. I know I am. I know I am. I was talking to my niece yesterday and I said, I call her Munchkin. I said, Munchkin, we have prayer meeting tonight. Yeah, when I come home, we'll have a heart-to-heart -heart talk face-to-face, -face, but i got prayer meeting tonight, and I'm going to be praying for you. So when Hannah and I were praying, I said, Hannah, we got to pray for Cousin Lauren right now. She needs us. She needs to know that, they're, that we love her and that we're praying for her and that we're lifting her up. Churches, these things are important. These things are vital. Here, God is, uh, as David is crying out to the Lord, and the Lord is hearing from heaven his voice and, and from his temple. And he even heard King David's cry even to his own ear. Think about that. You can go right to God right now through Jesus Christ. We couldn't get a hold of the president if we wanted to. I don't think anybody here has that contact. My brother, who's chief of staff for a senator from Montana, he tries to call and would love to speak to the president, but he, and he works on Capitol Hill. All he gets, he got to talk to the chief of staff twice. That's as close as he got to the president. Guess what? You can go to the King of Kings Amen. and the Lord of Lords today. We can call on him in Jesus' name. And he will hear you with his own ears. Yeah. We'll say, Pastor, isn't he pretty busy? But he's God. He knows the voice of his sheep. And we can call on him, church. We can call on him, and God will hear us. And I don't know about you, but I think God can do a lot more for me than President Obama. Amen. Or Governor yeah. LePage. I think he can do a lot more for me. And here, King David is putting right into action what we need to do as believers. And Christmas time is a great time to do it. Christmas time is a great time to do it, church. Because if you don't do it now, it's going to be a rough Christmas for you. You may come here and put on a smile tonight at dinner and you might leave full with food, but you're going to have a hard time laying your head down to go to sleep, which is why I believe some people don't sleep here at night. Say, Pastor, how do you know people aren't sleeping? Because they're Facebook at all times of the day. Or they tell me they're not sleeping. Or you can look at someone and say, when was the last time you went to sleep? 
You know, some people, you know, we're, we're at least should be getting six hours of sleep a night as adults and teenagers. Sometimes our teens will come in and I'll see a post that they made at 2 a.m. and I'll ask them, how much sleep did you get last night? Oh, I went to bed about 9 o'clock. Oh, you did? Well, I was checking on a post from you on Facebook at 2.30 this morning. Oh, yeah, well. And then you fall asleep in my class. You know, this is, this is real stuff, church. But a lot of times, even why our young people can't sleep is because of all the trauma that's going on in their life and everything that's happening around them. Okay, and as those things are happening around them, it's really hard to lay your head down and go to sleep. Well, church, I can tell you today that God desperately wants us to call on Him. And I can tell you today that God desperately wants to speak to us if we call on Him. You say, Pastor, I don't know God. Well, I bring good news to you. You can know Him today. You say, how do, how do I get to know Jesus? How do I... I, I realize, I, I know full well I don't know Him. I know full well that if I die, I'm not sure where I'm going. I know full well that I've never had a conversation with God and I don't hear from God. How can I first know? Before you can become a sheep, you have to know Him through faith. And this is how you do it. According to the book of Romans, the first thing that every person has to do to know God is to admit that they're a sinner. Admit that they fall short of the glory of God. And by admitting that you're a sinner, we have to secondly admit that we need the Savior, Jesus Christ. To blot out our sin. When David spoke about salvation through faith, it's the same as today. It's still through faith in Jesus Christ, the one who shed his blood. After you've admitted that you're a sinner and admit that you need a Savior, you then need to admit that, or believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. Jesus didn't stay in the manger, church. It started in the manger. But he said it's finished on the cross. We must believe that he suffered and died. Well, this communion Sunday, this is a great time to do it. You can know God. Teenagers, you can know God today. Adults, you can know God today. Seniors, you can know God today personally. And after we believe that he died, we must believe that he rose again the third day to prove that he is the Savior of the world. Thirdly, we must confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And by confession, you're saying, Lord, I died a self. You died for me, so I'm going to live for you. My life now belongs to you. That's where David can say, Lord, I love you with all my strength. Because David loved God. He was a man after God's own hearts. And then lastly, Jesus called everybody publicly. We're publicly going to take communion in just a moment. To know Jesus, you must know that he died publicly. And he's looking for you to make a public confession to Jesus Christ right here today. You're not going to have to say anything to anybody. Just by you stepping out of your seat and coming to this altar is public enough at this invitation right now. The invitation is in your hand. The question is, will you go? Do you want to check the box and say, yes, I will go. I will go and know Jesus as Lord and Savior in my life. If you do that from that point on, you can call on the Lord. And He is right there. 2 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You can call on the Lord. And He will hear you. And He will bless you. The question is, church, will you call on the Lord? Father God, I thank you for your word here today. Lord. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services, Sunday School for all ages at 9 a.m., Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10 uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.